on World News Tonight. International failure. The global community watches in shock as the ISIS raises its head once more after the Kabul attack. Ending ties. The German foreign minister declares the end of its Afghanistan mission and vows to help those left behind. Plummeting cases. The WHO states that the global COVID cases seem to be flatlining and requests people to keep getting jabbed. Allo livelihood. Aloe vera farmers in India keep prospering during the pandemic due to the plant's Ayurvedic properties. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with a look into the developing situation in Afghanistan. A complex attack at the airport in Afghanistan's capital, Kabul, where a massive international airlift have been underway, caused a number of U.S. and civilian casualties. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby said an explosion occurred at the airport's Abbey Gate and there was at least one other blast at the nearby Barron Hotel. Injured people are helped to hospital in Kabul after what the Pentagon has called a complex attack on the city's airport. There have been a number of explosions and reports of gunfire as countries rushed to complete evacuations. French President Emmanuel Macron said France will try and evacuate several hundred more people but given the situation can't guarantee success. It's obvious that tensions are mounting considerably. We knew about these risks from the start, given the confusion in Kabul and the tension that there's been at the airport since the beginning. The next hours at the airport will continue to be very dangerous. Over the past 12 days, thousands have massed near the airport's entrances, hoping to be evacuated after the Taliban took control of the country. Earlier on Thursday, U.S. and Allied officials said they had intelligence that suicide bombers tied to the Islamic State group were threatening to attack the airport, ahead of Washington's deadline to finalize the evacuation next Tuesday. Islamic State suicide bombers attack crowds of people gathered outside Kabul airport hoping to flee Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, killing dozens including 13 U.S. troops as President Joe Biden vowed to hunt down those responsible. We will not a defiant warning by Joe Biden. We will hunt you down. Following the deadliest day for American troops in Afghanistan in over a decade. Thursday's attack on the Kabul International Airport was a major blow for the Biden administration, which has been ramping up evacuations ahead of its scheduled military pullout on August 31st. Yet the U.S. president stood by the deadline and vowed the evacuations would continue as planned. We will rescue the Americans in there. We will get our Afghan allies out. We will not be deterred by terrorists. We will not let them stop our mission. We will continue the evacuation. Meanwhile, U.S. troops on the ground remained on high alert, as the Pentagon said it was expecting more attacks in the coming days. It also vowed to retaliate against the Islamic State group, which claimed responsibility for the bombings. We believe it is their desire to continue those attacks and we expect those attacks to continue. And we're doing everything we can to be prepared for those attacks. We will go after them. We've been clear all along that we're going to retain the right to operate against ISIS in Afghanistan. The deaths of U.S. personnel were likely to pile domestic pressure on Joe Biden, whose decision to pull out from Afghanistan has been met with fierce criticism. Several Republican lawmakers have already called on Congress to delay the military withdrawal until all Americans are out of the country. In Australia, Prime Minister Scott Morrison stated that Australia has stopped evacuation flights from Afghanistan after Islamic State suicide bombers killed scores of civilians. Australia says it ended its own evacuations from Afghanistan on Friday after deadly twin bombings outside the airport of the capital, Kabul that left scores dead the day before. Prime Minister Scott Morrison broke the news. Australia's operations now for the evacuation have been completed. We were able to ensure uh, the departure of the remaining Australian personnel over the course of last night, not that long uh, before the terrible events that unfolded last night took place. 
Morrison said more than 4,000 people, including citizens and Afghans with visas, had been evacuated over nine days. But with security compromised after the attack, claimed by Islamic State, he said it was no longer safe to continue rescue missions. Australia condemns the evil, the calculated and inhuman attacks that were undertaken in Kabul overnight on the innocent and on the brave. It is unclear how many Australians remain in Afghanistan. While the United States and others continue with evacuation flights, Morrison warned it was unlikely Australians and visa holders would be given seats. Canada says it has also ended its evacuations, while Britain has declined to specify when its last flight would leave. France has said it expects its own operations to be completed Friday evening. In Germany, now Chancellor Angela Merkel stated that Germany will continue to help people who want to leave Afghanistan after suspected suicide bombers struck the crowded gates of Kabul airport with at least two explosions, despite vowing to end ties with Afghanistan. For more on this, we have Abdel Nobel, your special correspondent Inuka Ponzo, reporting now from Kleve in Germany. Inuka. Yes, Shanali. Deutsch Foreign Minister Heiko Maas announced that he would travel to Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and Pakistan in the coming days for talks on the latest developments in Afghanistan and how to continue evacuations. His talks will focus on how the international community can handle the situation in Afghanistan and under which conditions agreements with the new government in Kabul are possible. Germany's diplomatic efforts follow the official end of the Kabul air bridge to get Afghan and foreign nationals out of the country. Chancellor Angela Merkel, Defence Minister Annegret Kramp Karrenbauer and Maas all spoke to the media within minutes of each other following news that all German army and mission personnel had safely landed in Tashkent. The US-led mission had been due to run until August 31st but was aborted after at least two suicide attacks left many dead and injured just outside Kabul airport. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adu Darana World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Kleve in Germany. Moving now to Mexico, officials familiar with the matter stated that the United States has urged Mexico to clear ad hoc camps housing thousands of migrants in border cities due to concerns that they pose a security risk and attract criminal gangs. The U.S. has urged Mexico to clear makeshift camps along the border, where thousands of migrants are vulnerable to crime and unsanitary conditions. That's according to official sources that told the White House is also concerned about the sheer number of people who could jeopardize security if they made a sudden rush for the border. The Reynosa camp sits across the border from McAllen, Texas, and is home to at least 2,500 people. It's also a hot spot for cartel recruitment, as many of the migrants fled Central America out of desperation in search for a better life. The officials emphasized the importance of eradicating conditions that encouraged that recruitment. U.S. President Joe Biden has faced criticism for a jump in illegal crossings. Apprehensions or expulsions by U.S. agents have more than doubled since he took office earlier this year. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the White House declined to comment. Mexico's foreign ministry did not reply to requests. The U.S. Supreme Court earlier this week ordered Biden to revive the Trump administration's so-called Remain in Mexico policy, which forces asylum seekers to stay in Mexico as they await U.S. hearings. That decision has alarmed Mexican officials who struggle to curb migration as it is. Mexico has stepped up its efforts to transport migrants back home in the past few weeks by flying them to the southern tip of the country by plane. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News. Welcome back. More than 100,000 COVID-19 patients are in hospitalized ICUs all around the U.S. The crisis is most acute in Florida, where the hospitalization rate has tripled in just the last three months. In Florida, the new hotbed of the pandemic, ambulance services overwhelmed by emergency calls. We have multiple COVID patients that want transportation. Nationwide, more than 100,000 COVID patients in hospital ICUs. The crisis most acute in Florida, where the hospitalization rate has tripled in just the last month. 
at Tampa General, the COVID ward today at 90% capacity, three times what they've had at the highest point last year. It's really just, it's like nothing I've ever seen. Florida hospitals now reporting 90% of those admitted were unvaccinated. It feels like it's almost worse than it was when it started last year. The patients we're getting are younger and they're turning sicker much faster. Florida's governor today encouraging vaccines, but actively pushing back against mask mandates. You just have to understand it's going to be part of, of life. Uh, and there's ways to protect yourself on the front end. There's also ways to treat yourself on the back end. We have some good news for you. After reporting a continual increase in new cases over the past two months, the World Health Organization says global COVID-19 cases seem to be flattening out. The WHO adds the more transmissible Delta variant has now been identified in over 160 countries. The WHO says some 4.5 million COVID-19 cases have been reported globally over the past week, which appears to be stable following an upward trend since mid-June. The global agency says this is only a slight increase from over 4.4 million cases reported during the previous week. By region, the Americas and Western Pacific logged an increase over the past week by 8 and 20 percent, respectively. That was attributed to the rampant spread of the Delta variant, which the WHO says has now been detected in 163 countries. Amid the continued spread of the Delta strain, Johnson & Johnson says a booster dose of its single-shot COVID-19 vaccine six months after the first dose shows a nine-fold increase in terms of antibody response. The company adds that a booster appears to be safe and triggers immune responses substantially. It said earlier that people who've been vaccinated with the Janssen vaccine still had a durable immune response at least eight months later, even without a booster. Such data could be reviewed by U.S. authorities to decide whether to recommend a second draft for some 14 million Americans who received the Janssen vaccine. In the U.K., British researchers say they've witnessed waning protection against COVID-19 infections among individuals who've been fully inoculated. Researchers at the Zoe COVID-19 study conducted a thorough analysis on some 1 million people who received two doses of the Pfizer or AstraZeneca vaccine. They concluded that protection after two jabs of the Pfizer vaccine declined from 88 percent at one month to 74 percent after five to six months. For AstraZeneca, from 77 percent to 67 percent at four to five months. Despite those results, researchers insist that vaccines are crucial in protecting people against severe symptoms and potential death, even if they get infected. Delta cases in Sydney have slightly gone down following the country's decision to approve vaccines for children. For more on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy. Yes, Jenan. Sydney's COVID-19 cases slightly eased, but still hovered near record levels as the Australian federal government looks to press states to stick to a national reopening plan once the country reaches a 70 to 80 percent vaccination rate. New South Wales recorded 882 new cases, most of them in state capital Sydney, down from the record 1,029 on the previous day, as officials struggled to quell the Delta outbreak. Two new deaths were also reported. The National Cabinet, a group of federal and state leaders, will meet later in the day against a backdrop of concerns by some states, given the persistently high daily infections in Sydney, even after two months under lockdown. So far, 32% of people above 16 have been fully vaccinated and based on current rates, Australia should hit 80% by mid-November. Australia's expert vaccination panel on Friday approved the use of vaccines for children aged 12 to 15. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. As a means of gaining justice, several Capitol Police officers sued former U.S. President Donald Trump for instigating the violent far-right mob attack on the U.S. Capitol in January this year. 
Seven U.S. Capitol Police officers on Thursday sued former President Donald Trump, alleging that he conspired with far-right extremist groups to provoke the deadly January 6th attack on Congress. The officers in the lawsuit filed in a Washington, D.C. federal court alleged the attack was a culmination of months of rhetoric from Trump, who they say knew of the potential for violence and actively encouraged it in hopes of halting the certification of President Joe Biden's election victory. The lawsuit alleges Trump conspired with the extremist groups, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, as well as far-right political operatives, who promoted Trump's speech near the White House right before the Capitol attack. We will never give up. We will never concede. A personal lawyer for Trump did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The case is the latest in a string of civil lawsuits seeking to hold Trump accountable for the Capitol siege by a mob of his supporters. Four people died on the day of the violence, one shot dead by police and the other three of natural causes. A Capitol Police officer who had been attacked by protesters died the following day. Four police officers later took their own lives. Welcome back and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern eased the tough nationwide lockdown measures, although businesses and schools will still be closed and its biggest city, Auckland, will remain shut for longer. A rare snowfall surprised the residents of El Salvador, a small town located in the Chilean desert of Atacama. This phenomenon usually takes place every two or three years in June and July. At least 20 people have died in the western Venezuelan state of Merida following intense rains that caused mudslides and rivers to overflow. More than 1,200 houses had been destroyed and 17 people remained missing as rescue workers searched the wreckage. A fast-moving wildfire ripped through trees in South Lake Tahoe, California, as firefighters struggled to keep the Caldor fire from spreading. Formula One stop drivers were all gathered at Spa Franco Chant ahead of the Belgian Grand Prix. Williams driver George Russell explained that there were currently nothing to report about any potential contract with Mercedes and that he would rather do things right instead of quickly. In the tech world now, U.S. officials have approved license applications worth hundreds of millions of dollars for China's blacklisted telecom company Huawei to buy chips for its growing auto component business. U.S. officials gave a green light to companies looking to sell microchips to the blacklisted Chinese tech giant Huawei, helping to fuel the firm's vehicle parts business. The approvals are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. That's all according to two people familiar with the matter. Huawei is the world's biggest maker of telecoms gear, but it has been stumbling under Trump-era bans against it buying U.S. products. The sources exclusively told that in recent months, the U.S. has given approval to suppliers to sell Huawei chips that go in car parts, including video screens and sensors. Auto components generally aren't considered sophisticated, and Huawei has pivoted toward items that are less likely to fall under U.S. bans. The Biden administration has continued to deny Huawei chips that would go in 5G-capable devices like smartphones. The US has gone to great lengths to suppress Huawei's key business in 5G-related products and pushed allies to exclude Huawei from their 5G networks, citing concerns that Beijing could use Huawei gear for spying. When asked about the licenses, a U.S. Department of Commerce spokesperson said the government continues to apply licensing policies to, quote, restrict Huawei's access to commodities, software or technology for activities that could harm U.S. national security and foreign policy interests. A Huawei spokeswoman declined to comment on the licenses. And finally, tonight, a village in India's eastern Ranchi city has earned the name of Aloe Vera Village as the uh, cultivation of the medicinal plant is done in abundance, helping villagers earn a good income. With every household in Devri village cultivating aloe vera near their houses, the plant has not only added beauty to their courtyards, but also helped them sell it and earn money. 
The production of aloe vera in the villages has also allowed women to engage in its cultivation, earn a livelihood and become self-reliant. The aloe vera cultivation in the village began in 2018 when the villagers received training under Bursa Krishi Vishavidyalaya and slowly started earning income with the knowledge of the plant. The plant is used in Ayurvedic and allopathic medicines for ailments related to skin and digestion, amongst others. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.